Hi, it's the Chappiness guy. Welcome to today's episode of Vestibular Talks. I know it's been a little while since we last saw each other, but I'm here again, and I'm going to share with you a very special episode today. Today's special guest is Patrick. Patrick from Bad Ass Healing. Yes, Bad Ass Healing. He's going to share with us how to conquer many years, anxiety and chronic pain, and some sort of strategies that he applies, like mindfulness, neuroscience, and lifestyle changes that allow him to conquer his life condition. Welcome to today's episode. I hope you like it. Remember to share, subscribe, and like, and we'll chat soon. Find your happiness, guys. Hi, Patrick. Welcome to this episode of Vestibular Talks. How are you today? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Patrick, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and how your journey began? Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, I uh, was originally, well, I, I live in Colorado, I'll start with that, but I, I uh, was originally diagnosed with Meniere's disease when I was 15 years old. Um, so just a sophomore in high school and, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know how much detail I, I should get into at, at this point. Um, but yeah, the, the original diagnosis was made when I was 15. It came with all the classic symptoms, um, partial hearing loss in, in one year. Um, and we, we had been tracking that for a couple years prior. I, I had failed one of those school administered hearing tests. Um, and they were kind of always wondering like what it could be because it was that kind of low frequency hearing loss, which is pretty classic for many years, but I didn't have the vertigo. Um, and then sophomore year of high school, the vertigo hit really hard um, one day. And that's when they formally gave me the many years diagnosis. And um, th 32 years old now. So I've been living with it for, for over, over 15 years. And, you know, the, 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 I'd say the first 10 years, I, I was obviously still regu like regularly having symptoms, um, but I was able to manage things pretty well. And then about five years ago, things just started getting a lot more sensitive. I started getting symptoms on a reg more regular basis. Um, and then things escalated to the point where I was getting like daily vertigo, my anxiety was through the roof. It was became really hard for me to work. And in, in um, late 2021, ended up making the tough decision to take time off work, um, kind of put an eight year career on hold and really pushed the pause button on my entire life um, to, to get this whole thing straightened out. And um, yeah, since then I've, I've luckily been able to, to find some new solutions that I didn't know existed before, um, just through lifestyle changes alone. And, and um, happy to say that I've, I've reversed the, the, the bulk of the symptoms that I, I once thought <laughs> I, I couldn't get a hold of. So, uh, As, uh, well, the first reason why I find it very interesting is because Meniere's disease is not a common or Meniere's syndrome. It's not a common diagnosis among young people. As you, as I'm sure you know, many mm -hmm. people that get diagnosed with Meniere disease are usually in their late 30s, maybe late 40s. So for you to have had it at 15 years of age, that's quite, uh, quite interesting. Now, when they diagnose you, how did they diagnose you other than an audition test when when uh, with the hearing test, when they can find the low pitch that you're that you're sensitive to, to that, how, what did did they do any other testing? Did they run any other things to try and and maybe find other diagnoses, or the or the doctor right away said, hey, I think you have many years. Let's check you for this. The doctor right away, yeah. I mean, the the hearing loss certainly suggested just the type of the hearing loss I had suggested that it was many years, and. Um, then 
when I started having the vertigo, that's when they made the diagnosis. And you know, I can't, I can't remember at the time what other tests they did. I don't remember them doing many other tests aside from, from the hearing. Um, and, you know, I even went around to different specialists when I was uh, in high school, like my dad and I flew around the country to different specialists. And, you know, maybe I'm just like not remembering it, <laughs> but I don't remember too much testing. It, it was later in life when I remembered, like when my symptoms started getting worse, there was an ENT doc that I went to in Denver that did um, caloric testing yep. where they confirmed that um, there was damage to the vestibular nerve on my left side uh, relative to my right. So, um, you know, but I, I don't remember them doing much testing up front. I think it was just the, you know, you have that that low frequency hearing loss, it fluctuates, you have inner ear pressure that fluctuates and the vertigo. And um, that's kind of how they how they yeah. arrived at it. Yeah. Um, for a 15 year old, I mean, you're, you're in your at an age that you just want to be out playing with your friends. You just want to be exploring, doing a lot of different activities and things. So for a 15 year old to develop something like this, especially the vertigo attacks, as you know, they can be very debilitating. Um, how did that change your life? As Because I'm assuming prior to that, you were probably a very healthy child that did all your activities, went out, went to school, did live a normal life. So how, how did everything change once you started experiencing the hearing loss, the vertigo, the, all the different symptoms? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, well, obviously at, at first, like that first vertigo attack is just absolutely terrifying, right? Like you don't know what's going on. I remember like I was in like sophomore Spanish class and you know, the room just starts spinning around you. Well, first you get some odd sensations and then the room just started full on spinning around me. And it was like, did, did someone spike my Fruit Loops this morning or something or what? <laughs> um, so obviously that, that was pretty frightening. And um, you know, what's funny is that I, I probably had a couple episodes a month, maybe one or two episodes a month, but I don't remember it bugging me too much. And if, if I like reflect on just my whole journey with veneers, um, you know, I think when I was young, I just like, it just didn't register with me what my diagnosis really, really meant and what it was going to mean in the mean in the future. And like, I, I certainly read, you know, I, I experienced the symptoms firsthand. I read articles about what it could mean long term, and you know, you kind of see the horror stories online about what what it's like living with this stuff. And like somehow, I just completely pushed all that stuff to the back of my mind. <laughs> um, and you know, I, I just tried to live the most normal type of life that I could. You know, I, I still went on a low sodium diet during the weekdays, but on the weekends, I, I would I would inevitably cheat and <laughs> eat out with friends and stuff. And I was on the diuretic and, um, you know, I, I do remember like it being a distraction, like I, specifically when I had to focus at school on like a test, mm -hmm. I had to apply for extended time on tests because I had the terrible tinnitus and it was just really hard to focus. Um, but I, I was like a really, I don't know, I was an extremely driven kid, kind of that type A personality. My dad had that too and kind of instilled that in me <laughs> for sure. Um, but I became an expert at pushing, pushing through it. Okay. And I wouldn't learn till much later that the way that I was behaving and pushing, how I push through symptoms, how I push through stress, kind of that grin and bear it mentality, um, definitely fueled um, the flare up of, in symptoms later in life. Okay, earlier, Patrick, you mentioned that the, you have been able to kind of manage the symptoms with some lifestyle changes. Do you mind sharing what those lifestyle changes are? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. The the biggest change for me, you know, I I, I always knew that. Um, I mean, there's the regular trigger triggers, right? The sodium and the booze and caffeine. And um, like I said before, I was low salt for most of my life. The booze, um, you know, weekdays I would not drink. And then on weekends when I was in college, I had, I, I drank. <laughs> right? And I was like, even if this means I'm going to get a little vertigo, you know, I'm going to have a good time with my friends and <laughs> whatever. Um but the last couple of years, I've had to completely eliminate um, all those 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 three triggers: booze, caffeine, sodium. Obviously, can't eliminate all sodium. But the and then I, I always suspected that stress played a role. Yes. Um, and you know, after I left my job, it was almost automatic. You know, I was doing a lot of stress reduction techniques, like doing a lot of mindfulness. And at first I became a bit of a bubble boy and I was like, I need to avoid everything and like really try to relax and which was not something I was used to at all. But I, I could immediately see that like a lot of my symptoms went down. But as soon as I, as soon as that stress started turning on a little bit, my, my symptoms would yeah. turn on almost instantly, you know, like just a few negative thoughts. And after leaving work, it was like I got my symptoms under control. Um, I, I, I managed stress. I, I went on a, I, I follow the guidance of an emerging field of medicine called lifestyle medicine that, that recommends a, um, a whole food, predominantly plant forward diet. So I was doing a lot of plant-based eating, eliminating processed foods and exercising daily, um, trying to get better sleep, so that, that was a lot of the foundation for the healing. Um, but the, the biggest turning point for me is when I, when I under, better understood the link between my stress and my symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that took some time to get there. Like I, I, th I felt like I was absolutely crazy at first because I, I had, I'd get my symptoms under control. I'd get my stress down. But then as soon as I would like get back to my computer and start working, I had developed this like crazy anxiety response. Yes. Um, and I think it was from years of, you know, pushing through in a high stress job while having symptoms going on in the back of my mind, right? Yeah. It was like, you'd have, and you, you know this, you know, you have a, a client meeting or a presentation or something important. And it's like, in the back of your mind, you're thinking about like, what if I get vertigo, you know? Yes. And um, but the, the biggest turning point for me is when I stumbled into some new research being done in the world of, of pain and, and symptom neuroscience, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, talks about how, um, how the state of our nervous system directly impacts the experience of, of our symptoms. Yes. Right? And, and a nervous system that's been sensitized by exposure to stress, like living under the constant threat of vertigo with, with many years, can, can sensitize your nervous system and cause it to, to amplify your, your symptoms. And, and that was the biggest turning point for me because suddenly like I, I, I had an explanation for, for why it was so sensitive to stress and why like just a couple thoughts could could fire up vertigo, yes. um, and because uh, that makes you feel crazy, right? You like you go to yes. your doctor and you're like, he asks you how you're doing, you're like, man, I you know I re I really think this stress thing has a com like a, a role in it. And a lot of ENT docs, you know, I can't speak for all of them. This would be an unfair generalization, but they're not going to really help you much with your stress, right? Um, you know, they kind of have their their toolkit that they that they use, which is which is extremely helpful. Um, but you know, it starts to make you feel like there's something wrong with wrong with you. <laughs> yes, uh, I I understand completely what you're saying and agree. I couldn't agree more. And you're right. We live in a society or we live in a world that is constantly rushing at everything and, and over overwhelming ourselves with information all day long. That when you are in that fast-paced environment, anything like 
multiple phone calls or even video chats like this or replying to emails or knowing that you have to go to a work meeting, things like that, or even going to a supermarket, a place that is busy with all this input of information, it will trigger symptoms for, for many of us. So it's very difficult for us to calm our nervous system down because we live in, we're so exposed to, to all these different things all day long, and we live in a world that kind of praises living fast, doing many things at once, multitasking that is so difficult for our system to actually relax and, and, and breathe and take one thing at a time. So I found that doing yoga, meditation, they help cold showers, cold, daily cold showers. It also helps bringing your, your nervous system to a, to a more relaxed state. So, but I agree with you. There is, a, there is a big, big influence on how your nervous system perceives stress and how that stress awakens symptoms in us, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Patrick, mm -hmm. when many of us start experiencing these conditions, the symptoms are so surreal and so difficult to explain that a lot of family members and friends don't really understand what we're going through and they don't relate to what we're going through. How was it with you and your family or your friends? Like, were they supportive? Were they understanding? Or were they kind of like telling you like, no, Patrick, this is all in your head. Like, this is not really happening the way you're describing it. Like, how was it? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's always, I'd say it's always hard to tell what another person is thinking. You know, you, you don't really know. Um, but it certainly feels like when you're talking to someone about it, that that they don't understand right and it's because they don't right and that's not necessarily it's not necessarily their their fault um that they that they don't that they don't un understand it um because it's just such a bizarre sensation such a bizarre um you know thing to go through uh that you know they're they're just not going to really uh, understand it and um, obviously there, there were some people in my life that were more supportive than, than others and would be open to talking about it. But I think on the whole, when, when you live with a condition that's relatively rare and that people around you don't have, um, just the way your, your brain works, that starts feeling pretty isolating and, and lonely for you. Right. And um, just having nobody around you that can really validate your experience starts contributing to those own those 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 feelings of like not being worthy, being different, being odd. And, and you know, I talked about those feelings of like, gosh, it's so crazy how stress almost instantly impacts my symptoms. You know, that starts already building that belief of like, is there something wrong with me? What's going on? But when you're around people who don't understand what you're going through that only feeds that storyline even mm -hmm. even more and i i honestly didn't i didn't talk about it with a lot of people like at all i i would say and when i did it was a joke you know i would i would cover any discomfort i think i had with some self-deprecating humor it was like oh like yeah pat is he's got to eat his weird low salt foods, like he, he, ha, ha, whatever. But I never really talked about what it, what it meant. Yeah. And, um, you know, I had that causes tons of emotions and different things to, to bottle up. And, you know, I, I was one also that was like, you know, I, we weren't the most touchy feely family. So like, we didn't really talk about our emotions that much, talk about our feelings that much. And um, also a guy, and there's kind of the stigma about talking about your feelings and emotions there too. Um, but later on, I found that doing a lot of that emotional work, getting those emotions up and out, <laughs> you know, all, all, I, all of those emotions were there, you know, feelings yeah. of anger, isolation, deep, sadness and grief for missing out on things and I denied that all that stuff was was there for years but that it was part of some of these new these new treatments that I found in, in 
the world of, of symptom neuroscience that say like, hey, a lot of these built up emotions can sensitize your nervous system and kind of processing those and working through those is, um, is beneficial. Very true. Patrick, you also mentioned a low salt diet, which is common on people with many years. They, the doctors recommend a low salt diet. Um, it's not easy. Almost everything has sodium or salt in it. Like it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to, to actually have the commitment and discipline to follow a low sodium diet. Is there any, anything that you recommend to the people that are just starting to do it or they are trying to do it and fail and want to try again? Like, are there any tips that you say, hey, maybe start with this or maybe don't be too, too strict on everything? Like any, any tips or any advice? Um, trying to think, you know, I've been doing it for so long now. <laughs> it's been, I, there are serious difficulties with it. Um, I mean, the, the biggest thing is just being able to have access to, to your own kitchen and to be able to cook your own food. Right. And, and I'd say in college, that was the hardest time of my life to, to do it because I'm eating, living in a dorm. I don't have access to a kitchen. Everyone around me wants to eat out. Um, you know, I, I'd say at, at first, I was like buying up all these low sodium cookbooks, um, which were helpful. Uh, but what I've found is, but, but it also limits you, right? Um, Very much. And what I found is, you know, I, I can cook, I've learned to be able to cook almost any recipe out of a cookbook. And I just don't, I just modify the ingredients to be less sodium, right? Yeah. So any anything canned, I'm getting the no salt added version. Um, I'm obviously not adding any salt. And then, um, you know, anything processed like sauces, soy sauce, especially different things like that, I just stay, stay away from. Um, but, you know, the other big recommendation is like moving to a, a whole foods diet where you're not consuming processed foods. Yes. Um, that almost automatically starts lowering your sodium. And that's probably where most pe people get most of their sodium. So, um, you know, it takes it takes time to build these habits and, and work, but once I built the habits of, of eating a, a whole food um, diet where I was cooking most of my food, you know, the low salt eating wasn't as much of, of a challenge. Challenge, yeah. Um, yeah. You just got to get over you, you, and And cooking has become more of something that I enjoy now, right? I kind of pair it with my mindfulness work. Okay. Like before cooking was like, you know, I'm getting home. Got to get dinner on the table. It's busy day at work. I'm stressed as hell. I don't want to take time to prep this nice meal. Now it's it's like a mindset shift where I'm like, no, I'm gonna like chop these veggies with intention. Turn on some music. Make it more of a fun, fun thing. Um, and I I think that whole mindset shift of you know it's part of finding enjoyment where you're at and like that has been one of the biggest things in in supporting me and in. in that is true. Being right? able to cook more of my food. Um, and are there any natural supplements that you take overall for just your general health or anything that helps you in many years? Uh, I know a lot of people say magnesium. A lot of people say vitamin uh, D. Is there anything specific that you take or you don't really take any, any natural supplements? You know, I was, ch I was chasing some supplements for a while. Um, but... Uh, you know, after I, I, I was chasing supplements and I was, I was eliminating all sorts of triggers. I was eliminating all sorts of foods up, up front. Um, you know, my, my list of things to avoid was off, off the charts. And, you know, you talk about a restricted diet. It was, it was yeah. horrible <laughs> at first. Um, but once I learned about, you know, the origins of, of, a lot of my symptoms and how they were being fueled by by stress and in a hyped up nervous system. Um, you know, I actually 
learned and, and there's there's data and research on this for for a lot of chronic conditions that a lot the majority of the things that were triggering me were triggering my symptoms just because my brain feared them yes <laughs> you know i started avoiding you know i did an elimination diet and it showed up that you know, my stomach would get a little upset when I ate tomatoes or gluten or wheat. And, you know, I eliminated all these different things. And then I, my brain would start making these associations. Then I would eat a piece of toast and I'd be like, you know, my symptoms are a little worse today or, um, and, and I actually learned the neuroscience behind that, that that can absolutely happen. (laughs) Um, so I was on, I'm trying to remember the supplements. It was like a lemon bioflavonoid. I was on that. Um, Vinpocetine was one I tried. Um, Picogenol may not be pr- pronunciating all those correct, um, but I, w- I was chasing that that crazy long list of potential supplements and those those quick fixes. But when I, when I dove into some of these, these new treatments that go after desensitizing your nervous system, all, right. all of that, all of that went away for me. Yes, that's very, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Everything that you say makes so much sense because many of us can relate to you, to your journey. Um, Patrick, this, you said earlier, rare conditions, which they, in a sense, they are rare because they, they are not, there are not a lot of studies out there about them. They, they, they are kind of common because there are a lot of DC people in the world. There are a lot of people that experience vertigo. And I think part of it is what you mentioned, the, their nervous system being overexcited, um, which is a common thing nowadays. But as you and I know, these conditions are chronic conditions that don't kill us. They don't kill us, but they change our lives completely. We, you have to, like you said, you, you have to stop working be, if the condition gets too much out of control. Some people have to stop driving because they don't know when they're going to get the next vertigo attack and they don't want to risk it maybe being driving, being behind the steering wheel and, and injuring or hurting someone else. Um, some people have to become dependent of, of someone else because now they they can barely function because of, of daily balance loss. So, so many things like that. You're young, you're 32 years old what, like, how do you picture your life? Like, what, what do you think is going to happen now that you're 32 and you said, okay, I have it managed for the most part. Obviously, n- neither you nor I know the future, so we don't know if, if this is going to get completely better or it's going to get completely worse. We don't know, but we try to live our best life while we can. So at 32 years of age, what are some dreams, some goals, some things that you still want to achieve and maybe some other ones that you had to put on a standby for now while you keep trying to reverse the symptoms, reverse the, the progress of the condition. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. And it would be interesting if you asked me this, I mean, just a year ago, I'd probably have a very different answer. <laughs> um, Cause I was certainly at a point where I was like, you know, my wife, I, I, I had been, I had this successful career, you know, I I was a good student and then I I quickly was moving up the ranks in my career and everything and um, continuing to take on more and more responsibilities, you know, do everything that I was supposed to do. And then um, the symptoms started getting worse and uh, I didn't really think about it that much, but, but in the back of my mind, like that was a threat an immediate threat to everything that I wanted in life, Yes, you know, and I didn't, it took me a long time to actually face it head on. I just ignored it. And I kept pushing through at work, hoping it would just disappear. And then it got to the point where I had daily vertigo. I couldn't, I couldn't think straight, you know, very basic things that I was able to do. All of a sudden it was like, you, you can't do this, you know, you're, you're falling apart. And like those, those types of negative thoughts came up. Um, and, you know, when I left my job, it was hard to tell what was going to happen. The, my mind went all over the place. You know, it was like, am I ever going to work again? Am I, 
my wife and I, you know, we're 32 years old. We're talking about gearing up to having kids and like, am I going to be able to have a family? Of course. Um, so all of that pretty much hung in the balance. And um, now um, that, that I've, I've really developed a lifestyle that supports my many years and I, I've, I've, basically partitioned that when, when I, when I, when I left my job, I mean, it was this big steaming pile of, <laughs> of, you know, what was, was my manure symptoms. It was like, it's this big mysterious black hole. You're yeah. like, what I'm throwing, I'm throwing darts at it. I'm, I'm hoping something is going to stick like, um, supplements, um, drugs, uh, alternative therapies. I mean, I did all sorts of different things to try to get, get, to try to alleviate my symptoms. But, you know, by applying some of these, these new techniques, specifically pain, pain reprocessing therapy, um, emotional awareness and the expression therapy, these are some new emerging techniques for, for desensitizing the nervous system. And, and, and they also include education on where our symptoms actually come from and how our, our brain and our nervous system impacts them. I've been able to take this big mystery of symptoms and partition it into a component that I know I have control over mm -hmm. and a component that, you know, there is some underlying structural element of Meniere's inner ear dysfunction that no one really still knows much about. Um, and I know that that's still there and I know that there's some uncertainty there, um, but I just have so, I can't, I can't even describe how much more control I feel like I have over it yes. now. And really just through life's, and it, it wasn't easy to get there. You know, it's mm -hmm. a lot of, it's work to get there and, or um, but in terms of my future outlook right now, you know, there's still, I, I had to ease my way back into work. I had to teach myself that it was safe to work again. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's taken time. And I'm at a point now where, you know, I've, I've re com completely redefined my, my career, what, what, what is important to me in life. Um, what type of work I'm actually going to, to do. I'm actually now starting a, a coaching business that brings some of these new nice. techniques and therapies to the Meniere's community. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I do think that, you know, it's possible that Meniere's could limit me, right? I'm, I'm not going, I'm not on that same tra trajectory that I was on before. I'm not like, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to take on stressful things. Um, I'm not afraid to continue challenging myself, but I'm also not going to take on like a, a 60 hour a week, 80 hour a week job that I was doing before, right? I'm never gonna do that again. Like you, you, you know your limits and your boundaries, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's, there's always uncertainty. Um, with managing many years, but by by taking a risk on some of these new new things that are coming that are that are coming out, and um, you know, focusing on the stress um, and and just lifestyle changes in general, I've been able to really minimize that un uncertainty. And I just want to, yeah, just emphasize for the sake of other listeners that you know that's 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 possible and. Um, it's possible for, for, for everyone. And, um, like I was certainly there when, 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 you know, when you, when you're in the midst of it and your symptoms are bad, it's like, what the hell am I going to do? <laughs> right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was going to be my next question, which you kind of answered already. I was going to say there are two types of people when it comes to chronic illnesses, the ones that feel defeated and feel that they've tried everything and nothing works and the ones that have tried everything and know that some things do work and, and are improving slowly. So I was going to ask him, like, do you have any piece of advice 
for the ones that feel like they, their life is over, like they, they, they are in this dark pit of, of symptoms, of, of anxiety, of, of not knowing what's going to happen. I was going to ask you, like, <clears throat> Johan, are you still there? You were breaking up a little bit at the end, but I, I think I... Can you hear me? Oh, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Your, your video is just getting a little pixelated. Weird. Uh, Let me know. But this channel is called Find Your Chappiness, which is a play on words of find your happiness. So what does Patrick do to find his chappiness? What do I do to find my, my happiness? <laughs> um, you know, I used to, a big part of my, my, my healing journey is redefining what I do to be happy. <laughs> and I, before I had all these crazy expectations of what I needed to, I needed to, to have this type of house or, or do these types of awesome epic events on the weekends. And I needed to be doing all these things to be happy. And there's still an element of that. You know, I'd love to get outside. I love to be with friends and family. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm much more happy now. Just, just being myself, not being stressed. <laughs> um, and uh, just just mo mostly just focusing on on the people in my life that are important to me and being able to to spend time with them. That's very can, good. can you hear me? I you were going I, in and out there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can hear you. I can hear you okay. fine. Um, Patrick, would you feel comfortable sharing where people can find you? Like, if anybody is going through. Uh, a difficult situation coming to terms with their symptoms would you like to share where maybe somebody can find you to find a word of encouragement yeah absolutely you, you can um you can check out my my website um <clears throat> it's it's called it's badass heal so b-a-d-a-s-h-e-a-l.com badassheal.com um I have my Instagram as well, Johan. I don't know if if it if it's easier to just drop it in the notes on this, I'll but link it. I'll, I'll put it yeah, in yeah. App. So yeah, I've got a website. Um, I've got an Instagram that I'm very active on right now, and then you can also um, email me as well, and I, I can give provide that that information. Um, awesome. But yeah, re real quick because I want to make sure I could answer that that other question. Do you mind if I do that? The, the, the oh, question no, that was please. before. Of course. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, I I just want to say that I that you, you talked about people who are kind of defeated from trying one thing after another and not having success. And I totally I totally get that. That's very real, right? I did that for years, um, and it was like you know, what am I going to try next? And is it even worth trying anything else? Am I just completely hopeless? And the, the message I'll, I'll give is that you, we tend to beat ourselves up for whether what we do works or what it doesn't, right? So we, we beat our, we measure the success by the result, which makes sense because yes. we're trying to get out of something. But at the end of the day, we don't always have control over what works and what doesn't. So my, my word of encouragement there is that it's it's not about whether it worked or whether it didn't. It's about whether you're taking a step forward, right? And mm -hmm. and one step at a time. Um, and you know, per personally, the, the 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 quick fixes for me sometimes yielded some improvement, but it wasn't. It wasn't the full picture, and and the full picture for me was really looking at the whole picture of of lifestyle. Um, so I just want to encourage you, yeah, wherever wherever you're at, um, you know, applaud you for your efforts to to date, and and wish you the best moving moving forward. Yeah, it is possible. You're right. If you're consistent, you keep just no giving up. Eventually, eventually, little by little. It's not something that you're gonna see a change from one day to the next, or maybe 
one week to the next, it usually takes weeks, months, maybe even years to, to start seeing that that progress. Um, mm -hmm. All right, Patrick, well, uh, it's been a great time chatting with you and getting to know you and learning more about how you've been able to manage and defeat uh, a, a condition that is, is life-changing. Um, you have a new friend here in Canada, so if, if you ever come to visit, make sure to, uh, to find me up here in Calgary. You're more than welcome to, uh, to come and crash. You have a spot here in Calgary to crash. And um, yeah, man, like I'm, I'm very happy that you reached out to me and that we were able to, uh, to make this happen. Uh, absolutely. Thank, thank you so much for, for taking the time. And yeah, that invite is on the table too. I'm, I'm based out of Denver. So if you ever stop by here, let me know. And um, I'll, I'll definitely plan on staying in touch in, in the future. Thank, right. Thanks so much for taking the time. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Patrick. Have a good one. Okay. Take care. Bye.